Hallelujah. 
Amen. One of my favorite quotes goes something like this. It says, when we see God for who he really is, then we will worship him as we should. When we see him as holy and merciful and mighty and powerful, then we will give him the respect, the all, the worship that he rightly deserves. I love hearing you guys sing. Turn around and wave and say hi. It's good to see everyone's face in real life. All right, now you can have a seat. Hey, it is so good to see you. If you are new, or maybe you've been a few times but haven't filled out our, our digital connect card, I want to just draw your attention to that. If you're new, you can text the word WELCOME to 325-221-3001. Just that one word, WELCOME. It's going to send you a few questions. You answer those. And really, what the heart behind that is, um, is we want to know you and serve you and help you take your next step of faith. You'll hear this, if you come to Colonial Hill, we're always talking about taking a step of faith. Whatever that step for you may look like, we're all on this different spectrum. We want to help you take whatever step of faith God's asking you to take. And so if you're brand new, this helps us get to know you, and it helps us serve you and help you on your faith journey. So, text WELCOME to 325-221-3001. If you do that on your way out, Miss Nancy is at that gray table in the foyer, and we have a free gift for you. We'd love just to see your face, say hi, give you something uh, just as a word of thanks. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Josh. I work with the students. And so if you're a student 6th to 12th grade or if you're a parent and haven't got the memo yet, this Wednesday we are not doing youth in the FLC like normal. We are doing youth at First Baptist Church at 7 p.m. Every youth group that I know of in town is going to be there, and it's going to be a citywide messy games night. When you hear messy games, you think, oh, they'll get dirty. No, it's going to be terrible, okay? And they're going to love it. It involves, like, mud and gross stuff, but one game is called paint tag. And so you may, like, want to put a tarp in your back seat for when you pick them up. You can just make the kids sit back there because it's going to be bad. So if you're a student or if you are a parent, they need to wear clothes that are for sure going to get ruined, okay? It's going to be memorable. I'm sure the pictures will be great. But that's this Wednesday at 7 p.m. at First Baptist, if you're in that 6th to 12th grade age range. Uh, lastly, this is the time of our service where we give our tithes and offerings. So we're not passing the plate, but if you want to give, you can give in the boxes as you exit. You can mail in your offering. You can give online. If you're a guest, there's no obligation to give whatsoever. But if you call Colonial Hill home, we always just want to point to the fact that this is a good thing. We get to give. We don't have to give. We get to give. Um, in light of just who God is, uh, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Like in, ingrained in the deepest parts of who God is, he's a person, he's, he's a God who gives and he's very generous and he loves us way more than we deserve. So when we give, uh, especially like our tithes and offerings, that is a way for us to reflect the very nature of our generous God who's loved us and just lavished us and blessed us way more than we deserve. So as you give, I would just encourage you to give with that in mind, all right? I'm going to pray. I would love for you to pray with me as well. Pray for your heart. Pray for Pastor Reed. Pray to receive all that God would have for you today and just ask him to bless our time together. God, we love you, and we thank you so much just for the privilege it is to be here. Um, thank you that we get to worship you. Thank you that we get to sing, and we get to open your word, and we get to worship you. Thank you for that great privilege that you've given us. Lord, I ask that you would speak through Pastor Reed. I know today has a lot of scripture, and it's a lot of content, but help us to receive all that you would have for us. Help us to apply and to internalize and to just really grasp uh, these concepts and this information, and I pray that you would just give Reed special favor as he speaks um, what you've laid on his heart. Lord, bless the offering that's given. I pray that we would continue to be able to impact and advance your kingdom in Scurry County and beyond through the gifts that are given through the generosity of your people who call Colonial Hill home. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor Reed. Just give it up for all the people in the booth in the back. I think Jerry and Julie who are helping us, making us look good, sound good up here. <laughs> Y'all doing okay? Good. 
Uh, let me tell you a couple of things before I jump into today's message. So first of all, um, if you are watching today, uh, we welcome you, all of you that are watching on Channel 2 or on Facebook Live. We welcome you to Colonial Hill Baptist Church. We consider you just as much a part of our family as those in attendance today. Come on, Colonial Hill. Tell them how much they're loved, and we welcome you as well. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to, if you're watching on Facebook and you missed the Sunday School lesson with Ernie Armstrong, um, you can actually see there's a pinned comment at the top of the Facebook comments, and it's we just moved Sunday School rooms. He's in the YouTube now instead of the Facebook. So go to the YouTube, click the link, and you can see that anytime throughout the week, but that's where you can find his new lesson. Ernie Armstrong has been teaching that, that Sunday School class for 35 years. Come on, that's crazy long. Yeah, so we honor him, so be sure you can catch that there. Uh, immediately following this service, we're going to have a kids' Sunday school teacher meeting. And then tonight at 5 o'clock, we're going to feed you, by the way. At 5 o'clock, we're going to have an adult Sunday school teacher meeting. We're going to feed you, by the way. Uh, we're getting Sunday school started again. And all the mamas said a big amen. amen. Yeah, you need, you need some kids. Like, be quiet. Shh. Right? Listen, you let your kids scream out. We don't have a nursery. We don't have anything for them. We're bringing that back very, very soon. That's what we're meeting about as you get those, those programs started again. And so you just let them cry out. If they don't cry out, the, the, the word says the rocks will start crying out. So you just let It's just like an amen to me. Ah! Yeah, amen. I'll take it. I will take it. Um, so that's okay. I love babies. Um, but anyway, we're, we're going to talk about Sunday school. We're, we're relaunching our kids' ministry. I think a lot of our leadership for a while has been waiting for COVID to end. You know, like, let's just wait till COVID ends, and maybe the, maybe the heat will kill it. No, it got worse. I don't know what happened, but um, instead of waiting for the world to change back, we recognize now we're living in a changed world, and so we're going to start changing the way we do ministry so that we can do those things in a safe way, in a COVID-friendly way, but offer some of those things. So I'm just warning you, Sunday school, kids' ministry, they're going to look different for this season, but I'd rather have them look different than not have them at all. Amen, anybody? So that's what we're talking about. I want to inform the teachers before I tell the whole church. By the way, I'm going to share some of that stuff tonight at our business meeting. You may not know this, but we have congregational governance, which means that you have an opinion, you have a voice that matters. We want you, this is your church, and so we want you to contribute your voice. If you're a member of our church, come uh, be a part of that meeting tonight. It's at 6 o'clock. We have that right here, and we do it every fourth Sunday and just kind of talk about some of the things that are happening in, in the life of our church. All right, so we... <laughs> We're in the middle of this series on the end times. We're this week three of five, and I've had so many great, kind compliments. Pastor Reed, I'm loving this series. This is so good. I'm getting texts and emails, and I'm like, just wait till week three, okay? Because <laughs> it gets really hard. Um, it's, I'm just telling you, it's rough today. I'm, just, I'm, I'm laying it out there for you. Some of you have been here since I got here in March of 2019, and you've heard me preach probably 75 times. I've never preached like I'm preaching today. So I saw some first-time guests. I'm like, not today, Lord Jesus. Like, they're, thank you for being here. This is not normal, okay? Um, but we're going to look at the end. And we're going to look, it's just the, the seven years of tribulation. That's what we're talking about. We're going to look at the last six chapters of Daniel and the first part of the book of Revelation. Because a lot of people are asking me with coronavirus and racial tension and economic recession and the martyrdom of Christians and moral decline, is this it? So let's talk about it. Um, and I, you can't talk about it without talking about these things. So I'm going to try my best to put the cookies on the bottom shelf. I'm going to try to simplify things. I'm just telling you, there's going to be moments where you're going to go, uh, I, don't, I don't have a clue. So I'm going to try to catch you up, get us all on the same page, buckle up, keep your hands and your legs inside the vehicle at all times. We're going for a ride. Y'all ready, church? All right. So we're going to start in Daniel. Now, Daniel uh, has a lot of prophecy. Daniel, the last six chapters were all things that had not happened when he wrote it. Now, a lot of that stuff has come to fruition, but they had not happened at the time that he wrote it. So let's start here in Daniel 9. So this is when he's summarizing all of these visions. Okay? So he says 70 sevens. Now let me explain this. So sevens here, some of your translations probably say weeks. Um, I think that's a poor translation personally. So sevens, it's, it's the uh, Hebrew word shua'e, which literally means periods of seven. So it could be weeks, it could be months, it could be years. I believe this is talking about 70 seven-year periods or 490 years. That's what I think this is talking about. So David, I'm sorry, Daniel saw 490 years 
of prophecy. Not every year, but he saw a lot of major highlights in those 490 years. Now let me just preface this by saying most of those have already come to fruition. So he saw it, and from the time he saw it to today, 483 of the 490 years have already happened. Um, so let me show you that. Okay, so 77s, or 490 years, are decreed for your people, that's Jewish people, and your holy city, that's Jerusalem, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. No one understand this, he says, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So at the time, Daniel had no idea they were going to go back into Jerusalem and rebuild Jerusalem. He didn't know that was going to happen, and that did happen. We read about that in Nehemiah and Ezra. If your Old Testament was chronological in chronological order, Nehemiah and Ezra would be at the end of the Old Testament because this had not happened yet, but it did happen exactly what Daniel saw. They went back and rebuilt the city. Until the anointed one, the ruler comes. Now notice anointed one is capitalized. So Daniel sees Jesus. He sees the Messiah. There will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Let me explain that. So there's 77 year periods, but Daniel breaks it into three chunks. He said there's seven sevens, there's 62 sevens, and then there's one seven. So he says there's the seven sevens, which is seven seven year period, which is 49 years. Now, if you'll go do some, some digging in some history books, not even the Bible, just look at history, how long it took them to rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, it took them exactly 49 years. Study it. And then it will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, so 434 years, the anointed one, or Jesus, will be put to death and will have nothing. So Daniel sees Jesus hanging on a cross for your sins and for my sins. And that happened, this is crazy, exactly 434 years from the time that Jerusalem was rebuilt to the time that Jesus is hanging on the cross was 62 sevens, or 434 years. So if you're like me, you're probably asking the question, well, where, where's the other seven? There's a missing seven. Let's keep going. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay? So in 70 AD, in AD 70, that temple that was rebuilt is destroyed again. So that happened in 70 AD. And he talks about a ruler. Um, some of your translations may say a king, but that's talking about the Antichrist. And a lot of times we think about the Antichrist as being this really evil dude, and he is indeed evil, but he's going to have an appearance as, as, as very um, approachable and charismatic. And he, initially, he's going to be a very popular person, very popular. He's going to get the whole world to follow him, which is why I know that this person is probably not anybody in political office right now because half of the population hates them. <laughs> I'm teasing, not really. Uh, so, so this person, he's going to be a very dynamic leader. He might be bilingual or trilingual. That's just my guess because he's got to convince a whole lot of people this guy should be ruling the world. So he's here. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. Now this Antichrist will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. This is the missing seven. This is the seven that hasn't happened yet. It's a seven year period called the period of tri uh, tribulation. That's what, that's what Revelation primarily is all about and what he's talking about. So what's going to happen? The Antichrist is going to basically broker a peace treaty with Israel. So the Israelites and the Palestinians are going to come to an agreement and this is really what Israelites are wanting. They want to rebuild the temple again. They want to reinstitute blood sacrifices like in the Old Testament. They want all of this stuff to happen. He's going to broker the deal, and there's going to be finally peace in Israel. In the middle of the seven, or three and a half years into the deal, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. So halfway through this thing, the Antichrist is going to say, ha, psych. And by the way, he's not going to be called the Antichrist. I'm the Antichrist. He's not going to do that. But he's going to say, I, I'm just kidding. You thought I was for your good, but I'm actually for your destruction. So he ends the whole thing, and at the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. Now the last two weeks we've talked a lot out of Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is Jesus talking about the end times. He has a lot of signs, here's some things that are going to happen. One of the things Jesus mentions is this, 
He said, this abomination that causes desolation. He's talking about Daniel. He's going, what Daniel saw, that's going to happen. The Antichrist is going to say, hey, it's illegal for you to worship Jesus. In fact, I'm going to put a, t- a statue of myself in the temple. So the Antichrist makes this statue, puts it in this temple in Jerusalem, and it's the, the statue itself is called the abomination that causes desolation. That's what that's talking about. Until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. All right, everybody understand? All right, let's pray. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know, that's a lot. So let me kind of let me kind of recap, review, okay? I know this is hard. Hang with me. If you like deep, today's your day. All right. Um, so Daniel sees 490 years. 483 of them already come to pass from the time Daniel wrote them to today. And he saw a lot of other things. He saw Alexander the Great. He saw uh, a king coming from the Greeks. He saw the Roman Empire taking over. He saw a lot of different things. I'm not talking about that because that's past history, and I think most of you are more interested in what's to come. So 49 years to rebuild the temple, okay? 434 years from that moment until Jesus gave his life on the cross, and then we have this seven-year period that has not happened yet, which is the period of tribulation, which is what we're talking about today. And I think this is important for us to study because Jesus talked about it. Daniel talked about it. John talked about it. Paul talked about it. Peter talked about it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to shift now to Revelation. And we're going to look at the first ten chapters of Revelation. You're like, really? Yeah, we're going to try. It's the cliff notes, right? Open the fire hydrant. Here we go, okay? It's a lot. And if you miss anything, thankfully we're on Facebook. You can go back and watch this later. We're on YouTube as well. Okay. Um, let me just say, I'm not going to answer all of your questions with this sermon, uh, but I hope that I can at least give you a road map so that when you're reading it on your own time, you'll have more confidence in its content. You go, okay, I remember Pastor Reed talking about that. All right, Revelation chapter 1. Y'all still okay? Okay, good. All right, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. So the word revelation, the root word of that is reveal. So it's like somebody opening the door going... Ta-da! Right? Or a magician pulling back the curtain. Voila! Right? It's, it's, I'm, I'm showing you something. I'm unveiling something to you. You now have more knowledge than you had a moment ago. You're seeing something. And Jesus goes, I want you to see this. I don't want you to be scared about the future. I don't want you to be nervous about the future. I want to show you everything. That's why when the Bible was written, over 30% of it was prophetic. He goes, I, I don't want you to be scared about what's to come. I want to show you everything that's to come. Okay, so this is what this is. He says, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything. So John, you remember John? John was one of his 12 disciples. He was one of the closest with Jesus. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he wrote Revelation. And so John sees this angel. This angel starts downloading information to John. He starts writing everything, everything that he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Then he says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. That's another cool thing about this series, is that you're blessed. It's the only book, by the way, of the entire Bible that begins and ends with a blessing. Revelation 1, you're blessed if you read it, and you you try to listen to this and apply it. And then Revelation 22 says, hey, by the way, you're blessed for just trying. So this is part of the reason we're doing this. I just want to bless you, okay? It's It's a blessing to hear this and try to understand it, because it is difficult to understand. So, go skip down to uh, to verse uh, 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So, he's on Patmos. Let me kind of catch up why he's there. Easter happens. Jesus dies on the cross for your sins and for my sins. He raises from the grave. He appears to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, including his disciples. Initially, the disciples were fearful because they saw Jesus. They're like, well, they killed him. They're probably coming for us next. They being these religious leaders who thought Jesus was blaspheming when he would say, I'm the son of God. They're like, no, you're not. And that's why they killed him. So they're thinking they're coming after us next. So they're locking doors. And then Jesus appears to them. And immediately, they just, they got a boldness. They just got this supernatural courage. They're like, I've seen Jesus. Like, I touched the scars, man. He's alive. He beat death. What are you going to do to me? Death doesn't even scare me anymore. So they got really aggressive and started sharing their faith. 
the religious leaders thought we killed this thing, that Christianity was going to die because we got rid of the leader, and it just got bigger. When he came back from the grave, and then you have these bold disciples going, hey, what are you going to do, kill me too? I got somebody who beats death, right? And so thousands and thousands and thousands are coming to faith. And so the religious leader said, we got to get rid of these guys. And so history records that every single one of those men were martyred. They were killed for their beliefs in horrific ways. Uh, one was shot to death with arrows. One was dragged through the streets of a city. One was beheaded. One was crucified upside down. One was flayed alive. I mean, just awful stuff. The only one who wasn't martyred was John. They tried to kill John, but they were unsuccessful. And so they said, we're just going to put you on this island uh, and you can just tell nobody about Jesus because there's nobody out there, right? <laughs> but John did not because Jesus said, I got a plan for you. I need you to write Revelation. So that's why he's in Patmos. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me, uh, behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. And it lists these seven churches that did exist in Asia Minor, which is today modern day Turkey. So he writes all this stuff down. Skip down to verse 17. When I saw him, so he says, who's talking to me? Turns around. I fell at his feet as though dead. Pretty fearful. And then he places his right hand on me and says, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. So who is John looking at? Jesus, yeah. I mean, he, he was dead and he's alive. He holds the keys to death and and Haiti, he goes, I'm looking at Jesus. He didn't recognize Jesus because Jesus didn't have his mortal body. He's in his glorified state, his heavenly state. And so it was pretty intimidating. He's like, whoa, and, but it's Jesus. He goes, right there for what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. That's what revelation is. He goes, write down everything you saw, write down what's happening right now, and I want to write you what I'm fixing to show you. And so John starts pinning all this down. Chapters 2 and 3, I'm not going to show you today, but they're letters that Jesus would write to churches. And I encourage you in your own personal time to read those. I'm telling you, if you'll read that out and then live that out, you'll have a very successful life indeed. Re Revelation chapters 2 and 3, it's, it's here are the seven things I want the church to focus on. It's really, really good. Now, I also believe at some point there's going to be a rapture. There's going to be a snatching away of the church, that God is going to take his church, all of those who call him Lord, say, I'm, I'm following you, he's going to take us out of here. I explained last week that I'm married and I love my wife, and uh, Jesus many, many times refers to the church as his bride. Well, if I knew wrath was coming, and you're going to hear about some of that today, if I knew wrath was coming, I'm taking JC out of the wrath. I love her too much. And I think that... that God's going to do the same thing with his bride. He's going to take us out of here. Now, there are some biblical scholars who are very smart who disagree with that. And they say, no, there's not going to be any rapture. And that's fine. I'm just taking the first elevator up, if you know what I'm talking about. So y'all believe that, I'm out of here, right? So <laughs> but it really doesn't matter what your eschatology view is. Uh, the, the conclusions are all the same. So whether you believe in a rapture or not a rapture, one of the reasons I believe that, one of many that I believe that, is in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, it's talking about church. Church, 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 church. Revelation 4 verse 1 says after this. After what? I think it's after the church age. Because from Revelation 4 1 until the end of Revelation, the church is never mentioned again. So that tells me we gone, right? Why wouldn't it talk about the church if the church were here? So I think the church is going to be gone, but again, there's some people that have different views. And that's, I will say this too, um, as we go through this, you're going to disagree with me on some of this stuff, and that's okay. You think about it, John is seeing the future. So let's just say John, 2,000 years ago, sees August 23rd, 2020 in Snyder, Texas. And he's seeing things that he has no idea, he doesn't even have the vocabulary for. He sees a car, and he's like, it's like a... A lion with round legs. Like, I don't even know how you, he's just trying to ride it out. He doesn't know, he doesn't know the word car. And so we can't take any of the, we can't be dogmatic about anything that we read in, in Revelation because it is just, we can just give our best guesses. And that's what I'm going to try to do today is say, here's what most scholars believe. Here's what some scholars believe. Here's where I land on that issue. Okay. So after this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, I will show you what must take place after this. 
And so John gets to see the throne room of God. We sang it a minute ago. Clothed in rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, roaring thunder. He sees it all. He sees the throne room of God. I would love, that's what Revelation 4 and 5 are about. I would love for everybody in the room to have five seconds in the presence of the throne room of God. It would change how you live. It would change how you give. It would change how you serve. It would change how you tell people about Jesus. I mean, it would change you. It would. So he sees that. Revelation 5, it says, Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne, so he sees in God's right hand, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. So he sees this, this scroll. It's got writing on both sides. And God's got the scroll in his hand. And they would take wax back then, and they would drip the wax, and then they would take, I wore my class ring so I could do this illustration. <laughs> <laughs> but he, they would take the, the ring and, the, and then they would put it in the wax. And if you didn't have the ring that would match the insignia of the wax, you could not open the seal. So that's how they would get documents to and from each other. They didn't have email encryption uh, back then. Uh, they'd have this little seal. And they go, do you got the ring? Okay, well then you can open it. So, so, th so there's a problem because we got these scrolls, got seven seals opening up seven different parts of the document. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. So John said, I just wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. So this is basically the title deed to planet earth. That's what this is, the scroll that he's talking about. And it also unveils or reveals the end times and what this seven years of tribulation is going to look like. So he's crying. He goes, oh, what? nobody can open it. Then one of the elders said, don't weep. See, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, that's Jesus, okay, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and it's seven seals. And so that's awesome. So Jesus is able to open. So he starts opening it up. And every time he breaks a seal, more of God's wrath is poured out on planet Earth. Now let me just say... As we shift now to Revelation 6, we start to see the Antichrist come back up. We talked about that with Daniel a moment ago. So you're going to kind of see some parallelism between Daniel and Revelation. Let me also say that he's going to come and sign that peace treaty. If the peace treaty is signed in Israel and you're still here, you miss the rapture, okay? Hang in there. <laughs> it didn't happen or something. I don't know. Um, what's so cool, though, is they are already preparing for the rebuilding of the temple. Like, they already have plans in place. The furniture for the temple is built. It's sitting in a warehouse. The only thing we need is for this dude, whoever this person is, to sign the decree. That's all we're waiting on. So when I say, I'm not trying to scare anybody. When I say, I think that we're the end times generation, every single sign has been fulfilled. That Jesus talks about, that Daniel talks about, that Peter talks about, that Paul talks about. Everyone has been fulfilled. And again, this is also ready. We just need a signature, and it's, I'm just telling you, like we, the end is near. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow. He was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Now, this is where most people in, who just love the Bible, they shut it and say, I don't understand anything more, right? Because this is getting into that seven-year tribulation. And again, this is kind of confusing, but I'm going to do my very best to help you out and help you understand it. So he says, he opened the first seal, and I see this first horse. You've heard maybe the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's what this is talking about. So the first horse is this white horse, and he says this rider was given a crown. Most biblical scholars, including myself, even though I'm not a scholar, would say that this is the Antichrist. Because remember, Daniel talked about him being a ruler. Here he's talked about having a crown. And we believe that this is when the peace treaty is signed. So it says that he was given a bow. It doesn't say anything about arrows. So this is what most biblical scholars believe is when a, a, a period of peace is going to come to Israel for three and a half years. Okay, and let's keep going. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth. That's another reason we believe the first horse was peace, because this one is going to cease peace. 
It takes peace from the earth, and to make people kill each other, to him was given a large sword. So this horse represents war. So there's going to be a period of peace for three and a half years, and then the war is going to break out. What follows war? When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. That's odd. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. What is that talking about? So this just means there's going to be severe famine. Okay? So you got two pounds of wheat. Listen, two pounds of wheat wouldn't feed me, let alone my family. And so I've got a family of four, and I'm working all day, and I don't have enough money to feed me, let alone my family. So it goes from peace, it goes to war, it goes to famine. When the lamb opened the third seal, the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So you have a period of peace, you have a period of war, you have a period of famine, and then you have a fourth of the world, which be almost two billion people currently, are killed. It's crazy. It's awful. Go to the fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. So in this end times, again, this Antichrist is going to look on the front end that he's supportive of Israel, and then he's going to backtrack and go, no, 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 I'm actually for your destruction once he gets his foot in the door. And he's going to make it illegal for anybody to worship Jesus. And if you worship Jesus, you're going to be killed. So these are people that were slain in the tribulation. So in that period, he says, you can't follow Jesus. But there's going to be enough people that have been to church a little bit and never maybe place their faith in Christ, and they're going to go, especially when like half their friends go in the raps, they're like, maybe there's something to that, right? <laughs> um, I got to tell you all this really funny story. I'm just going to digress for a minute. Y'all remember when we had that earthquake about 10 years ago? We, every once in a while, we have an earthquake in Snyder, and, um, and, 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 and it shook our whole house. Like it, the whole house shook, and we had a china cabinet, and all the china shook. So I went out the front yard. I lived out on El Paso Avenue. I went on the front yard, and I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if like a gas plant had blown up or if it was indeed an earthquake. And my neighbor, uh, uh, Troy Lilly, uh, came out. And he was out in his front yard. And we were like, did you feel that? Yeah, did you feel that? And then Billy Brock, some of y'all may know Billy. And uh, he, he was two houses down. And he came out. And he goes, well, I thought that was a rapture. But I see y'all are still here, so I'm good. <laughs> that's, that's funny. <laughs> so... There's going to be people that in that last time are going to go, I, I, I need Jesus, and they will be killed. And they're going to ask in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? So they're crying out, hey, we were killed. When are you going to avenge us and our blood? I watch as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? That's getting pretty bad. Um, talks about the sun turning black, the moon's turning blood red. Talks about that the stars, or maybe their meteors, are falling from the sky, like when you shake a fig tree and the figs start falling. I mean, it's just like it's awful. That kings and princes and generals and the commoner and the elite and the rich and the poor are all hiding in caves saying, protect us from the lamb for the wrath is pouring out on the planet. Now, before we get to the seventh seal, John goes back and he goes, let me catch you up and fill in some details that I've left out. So Revelation 7 is basically going backwards and saying, let me fill you in. It says, then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the seas. So all this stuff that's going to happen to the world, he, he stops them. He says, don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of God. 
Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of the tribes of Israel. These people are Jewish people, like Jewish by, by uh, nationality. So these are people in that last time that are going to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And God's going to protect them. He's going to seal their foreheads, which is so cool. Because if you remember in the Old Testament, when they were living in Egypt, the Israelites were, were enslaved in Egypt, and God began giving plague after plague after plague to try to get the Israelites out of uh, enslavement. Uh, he protected them. Remember the last plague, um, he killed the firstborn of every home. But he says, I'm going to protect my people. And so take a lamb, take the blood of the lamb, put it on your doorpost. And when the angel passes over, and that's where we celebrate Passover, passes, it'll pass over your house and protect your home. So he was protecting them in the Old Testament. We see him protecting the Jews here. He says, I don't want to harm them. Before all this happens, they're going to be saved. Then it says, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That's us. Come on, everybody. We're there too. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. I don't know why we have palm branches, but we do. All right. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? Where do they come from? I answered, look, this funny. Hey, John, who are these guys? You're the one giving me the mission. I don't know. You tell me. He said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So these are people who in that seven-year tribulation puts their faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? It goes on to say, therefore, they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Remember, they've come out of the famine. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them. That's something that's going to happen later. Nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. It's pretty cool. That's heaven. That's a picture of heaven. By the way, we're going to talk about heaven in two weeks. And it's going to be a really fun, uplifting message. Y'all come back, okay? <laughs> Let me apologize one more time to our first time guest. This is rough. I'm sorry. All right. So all this is happening. And then we go to Revelation 8.1. It says, when he opened the seventh seal. Remember, we got six of the seven. Here's the seventh one. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Silence in heaven for about half an hour. And this is why most biblical scholars believe that women are not in heaven. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Listen, this is not a funny message. I'm trying to incorporate. I'm sorry. My wife's going to kill me. She's not here. Okay. I'm so sorry. I love you, ladies. Y'all are the superior gender. We all know that. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> we said, why? Why is, there, why is there silence? He opens the seventh seal, and it's so awful, and it's so awesome that I, th I think it's just like, it's, it's one of those moments where you've been following Jesus. You're like, yeah, like I... I didn't waste all those Sundays. Come on, right? Like you're, you're excited, but then you see it happening to the world, and there might be people whom you know who didn't follow. And it, it just that would be devastating. I'd be like, it's cool, but it's, it's not cool. It's very bittersweet. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. So these seven, the seventh seal are these seven angels, and they're lined up with their trumpets. And every time they blow a trumpet, more wrath is poured out on God's earth. Now, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but it doesn't need a lot of explaining. It's just, it's pretty bad. I'm thankful that God's going to take care of us. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. It was hurled down on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. Again, he's just seeing this, and he's just writing down what he sees. Like, it's like a mountain. I don't know. Some people think that may be like an uh, atomic bomb. I, who knows? He sees this, and he's writing all this down. A third of the sea was turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star, blazing like a torch, probably a meteor, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark, a third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. 
The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. Now, let me explain that one. That one's kind of weird. So the abyss, as best as we can tell, is a dungeon in the depths of hell. And it's where all of these demons are bound. And the word star there, if you have your Bible open there in Revelation chapter 9, there's probably a footnote that says the star can literally mean a star, like a celestial being, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Like it can mean a star, but it can also mean an angel, which makes more sense. So this star is probably the fallen angel, or Satan. The Lucifer was an angel, and he fell. Okay? I saw a star that had fallen from the sky. Well, Jesus talks about that in Matthew. I saw Lucifer fall like lightning, he says. So this is probably Satan opening up this abyss, and this is what happens. Out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions on the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth nor any plant or tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. This just sounds awful. But that's going to happen. So these, I don't know. That's again why I want to rescue my bride. My rod hates scorpions or anything that stings like one. So I'm going to get her out of here. I think that's why God's going to take care of his kids. All right. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. These are four demonic angels. So when, when Lucifer fell, a third of the angels fell with him. And they're right now in the Middle East. At, at Euphrates, based on what this is talking about. And they're waiting for this moment. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. So a lot of people have already died. And now a third of mankind is going to die. I mean, just more. Look at this. The number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. That's 100 million. So, and some biblical scholars have, have wrestled with, is this a, a physical army? Which uh, could be. I think it's a spiritual army. I think these are, I don't, if you just read Revelation 9 and you read the details about, it just, they're, they're not anything I've seen before. So either John has just had a difficult time communicating that, or it's just something we've never seen. So it may be a spiritual army. Either way, it's awful. So all this is happening. Now, the seventh seal, we're going to open that next week. That's Revelation 11. I do want to show you Revelation 10 as we close. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said, take it, eat it. <laughs> That's funny. I don't know why. Here, eat it. Uh, it will turn your stomach sour. But in your mouth, it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and I ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. That makes me laugh. I don't know why. So he has this scroll. It's a little scroll, not a big scroll. So he goes, what you got there? And he goes, here, eat it. And so John's like, all right. And he starts eating it. That's weird, right? <laughs> And he goes, it, it, it really was bittersweet. Like, it, it tasted good, but then it got to my stomach. And I was like, ooh, ooh, right? And I think that the little scroll is representative of everything we've talked about. I think the little scroll is representative of, yeah, this is going to be really cool for Christians. Like, our faith has been made sight. Like, oh, yeah, we've talked about this in church. This is one of the reasons I gave my life to him is because in the end, we win, but I think it's going to make it very sour as well, because I'm like, man, I should have told more people. I should have been more aggressive in my faith. I should have shared it more. I should have, I should have lived differently. And I think we can't talk about all of this and then say, God bless you. Have a great day. Like we've got to, it's got to change how we live our life. Otherwise, I'm wasting your time and mine. I'm going to show you three more verses, and I'm done. Going back to Daniel. At that time, Michael. Now, Michael is one of three mentioned named archangels in the Bible. 
And every time we see Michael, Michael is either the angel of war or the angel of prayer. He's always doing one of those two things. The great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not, has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, what Daniel's talking about here, it's talked about in Revelation, is the, the Lamb's book of life. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, somebody's calling me right now. Come on, I'm at church. Uh, <laughs> they obviously don't know what I do. It's okay. It, it was actually, I think it was a telemarketer. So I should answer it and talk to them. Um, okay, I won't. The Lamb's Book of Life. Lamb's Book of Life. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, your name is written in that Lamb's Book. And that Lamb's Book is going to be read on the Day of Judgment. So they're going to say, did you put your faith in Jesus Christ? I see you did. Enter into your reward. But if you didn't put your, if you didn't put your faith in Christ, your name's not in that book, and you get to pay for your own sins. So he sees that name, and, and then he says, those people will be delivered. And this is still talking about the end times. This is another reason I believe the church is going to be gone. Like everybody who puts their faith in him, he's snatching us away. Because Daniel says, everybody whose names, they're going to be delivered. And this is all in that same text. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth. So these are people whose bodies are decaying in graves. Will awake, some to everlasting life, because their name's in the book. Others to shame and everlasting contempt, because they never placed their faith in Christ. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And that's what I want us to be, church. I want us to live as wise and not as unwise to make the most of every opportunity. And wisdom, not knowledge is knowing stuff. Wisdom is knowing how to apply that stuff. And we got to live as wise. Like the brightness. I want to shine. He's called us the light of the world. Right? What does the light of the world do? It makes things brighter. I want to walk into a room and I want the room to be brighter because I exist. Not because of me, it's because of Jesus in me that I just, you just bring some light to your office space on a Monday, right? You come in and they go, what's wrong with you? T-G-I-M, T-G-I-M, what is he smoking, right? I mean, like, I want that moment where you just come in and you're like, hey, how's it going? Right, don't ask for everybody, right? You just, you're the light of the world. And those who lead many to righteousness, lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's why we exist as a church. That's why I love that we're so missional. Listen, our church doesn't exist for the people who are here. Our church exists for the people who are not here. Amen, everybody? That's why we're here. We've got to lead many to righteousness. We've got to shine like the brightness so that many people, stars forever and ever, will continue to come to Christ because of our influence in Snyder, Texas. That's what this is all about. So if you hear all of this and you go, man, that was really good, or man, I'm really confused, but it doesn't change any part of your life, then you're not living as wise. That's what we've got to do. We've got to live as wise. We've got to shine bright and make Snyder a better place because we exist. Now, some of you would say, all this stuff makes me a little bit nervous because I've never, I've never placed my faith in Christ. I don't know if I would be delivered. If Jesus came and took his church today, I'm not sure I'd be going with him. I want to settle that for you. Listen to me. I want to settle that. If you came in here, I, we can change that today. Scripture says if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. You came in unsaved, you leave saved. Like, it happens today. And so I want to pray with you. And if that's you, you say, Pastor Reed, I've never done that. Well, let's do it. Or maybe you did it a long time ago, but you need to redo it. Great, let's do it. Let's solidify it today and start fresh. So I'm going to ask everybody to do me a favor to just bow your heads and close your eyes just so nobody's looking around because this is really a private moment between you and God alone. I'm not going to make you raise your hand. I'm not going to make you come to the front unless you want to. I, like literally, this can only happen in your heart if that's where you want it to stay for now. But I want to give you this opportunity. So if you're here and you say, Pastor Reed, I want to be in that prayer. I want you to pray this with me, just under your breath, just to mean it is the only real thing. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you came to earth to die for my sins. I believe you were buried and that you rose again. You gave your life for me, and today I give my life to you. Come into my life. Forgive me of every sin, past, present, and even my future sin. 
You're not going to be perfect, okay? He, he says, I won't cover all of them. Lead me. Be the Lord of my life. You are in the driver's seat from this day forward. And just thank Him for saving you, for forgiving you, for loving you, for leading you. In Jesus' name. Because it's by that name it's all possible. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now look up here real quick. If you prayed that prayer, I'm proud of you. It's awesome. But I want to help you. Okay? So I want to give you some resources. Okay? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to text and do one favor with me. Okay? And I promise you, I'm not, I'm not going to parade you around the church. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want you to text me. This one word, SAVED, to this number, 325-221-3001. You will get a text back which asks for your address. I promise I'm not going to come by. I'm not going to put a bunch of spam in your mailbox. I'm going to send you one simple envelope this week, which is going to have some resources. I, I don't want you to make a decision and then not have some follow-up, not have a next step. I'm a next steps kind of guy. So wherever you are on that continuum of faith, I want to help you take that step. So if, you, if you're watching online today, if you're watching on channel two, text the number, saved. Okay, I want to send you some stuff in the mail. And then fill out the address. I'm going to send you some stuff in the mail that will just help you in this new journey. For anybody who did that today, can we give them a round of applause? How awesome is that? I love it. Here's what I love to do in closing. Uh, we're going to sing that Revelation song one more time. we got a few more minutes. Um, sing Revelation song one more time. And uh, it's Revelation 4. That's, that's what we're singing. It's what John saw. But there's some of you here today that you say, I, I need that. Like, I need to tell you right now, I need to rededicate my life. Or I, I dedicated my life for the first time to Christ today. Or maybe you want to be a part of our church, you want to join our church. I'd be honored to meet you down here. I'm going to be down here at the front. Uh, and if that's something that you'd like, you want me just to pray for you. I'd be honored to do that. Uh, but for the rest of us, we're going to stand. Go ahead and stand. We're going to sing together. But if God's calling you to come down for any reason, to tell me about your new faith in Christ or... You want to get baptized, or maybe you just want to join the church, or maybe you just say, hey, Reed, I'm struggling with something. I need prayer. I'd be honored to pray with you while the rest of us sing. Won't you come? Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath of living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Sing that holy, holy, holy. Hopefully you know it by now. Let's sing it again. Come on, one more time. children. And God, if there's somebody here that hadn't quite crossed over that line, that's okay. That's okay. Totally okay. But I pray at some point, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray that God, you would move them across that line so they might know you and experience you in the way that I have and so many have, that God, 
You are life abundantly. You are life eternally. You are your life, your joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your faithfulness, your gentleness, your self-control. You are just, you're, you're, you're everything. Like, you're indescribable. So I want people to experience you, and I pray today has helped us take that step, one step closer to the person you want us to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, before you leave, let me say I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you. Thank you for being here. I'm sorry. It was rough. I am so sorry. This, that's one of those rides you get off the ride like, I ain't getting on that one again. My back hurts. Like you just, you know what I mean? It's just a rough one. But thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope that you're l less confused than when you came in. Maybe not. But uh, hey, next week, we're going to wrap this whole thing up. I promise it ends with a big red bow. And uh, we'll see you then. God bless you. Have a great week.